Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. You know, among the boxed sets that are technically sort of limited edition type things, but they're still humping around on Amazon and other places, I found this one recently, which I also sort of already owned, but I was looking and it's very cheap and it's really wonderful and it's very well put together and I want to talk to you about it. The Art of Nicholas Harnoncourt. Now, Warner has done quite a few Nicholas Harnoncourt boxes of various types and most of them have been extremely variable, but this one is really good. There was some sort of guiding intelligence behind putting this thing together. And so I'm just going to go through it. It's 15 discs at a very, very good price. It's like three bucks a disc or something. And first of all, it's in a nice box. See, look at this. It's not falling apart. In fact, you may not open it at all, which makes it even more interesting. No, it does open. There we go. It opened. And it's a nice sturdy box thing, which is terrific. And you get a very good, a very good booklet note about Harnoncourt and you know, what he did and Harnoncourtisms and Harnoncourtosity and all the Harnoncourtitiousness that he indulged himself in throughout his career. So that's nice. Do you know, at one point they mentioned this in here, he was making eight discs a year for something like 20 years. I mean, that's a lot. He recorded a lot of stuff. In fact, he may well be sort of the last major mega conductor to do sort of everything in large quantities. And of course, he was the only one who started from the bottom up, who began in the with early music in the early Baroque period and worked his way into the Romantic period, stopping, of course, at basically the 20th century, with a couple of exceptions, like he did some Bartok, and he, of course, we all know he did Porgy and Bess. <laughs> you know, or pardon me, it was... Alf Deutsch, you know, it was, it was, it was Porgy und, und, und Bess, yes, Porgy und Bess, but that was on RCA, so we don't have to deal with it. Let's talk about the stuff that's in this box, all 15 CDs, um, which have original jackets, more or less, are these, yes, they are, look at that, they're original jackets, sort of, basically, and we begin, oh, yes, with Orfeo two discs. This was a fabulous performance. This was like a an epic in recorded history to do this Orfeo on period instruments with the original cast. They dug them up and revived them and and they sound marvelous. Now actually it's not quite true, but you've got you've got Kathy Barbarian and let's see who else is in this because it's really a good cast. Um, let's see uh, Rotrald Hansman, Lajos Cosma, uh, Kathy Barbaria, Nicholas Simkowski, Eiko Katanosaka, and Max von Egmond, and Gunter Teurig, and Nigel Rogers, and Kurt Equiluz, and Jacques Villisek. Okay, so they're not household word names. They really get into it. I mean, these three Monteverdi operas that Harnoncourt did, you know, he did them twice. He did them first, these are sort of like the complete ones on period instruments that he did them in like Zurich Opera House and they were heavily cut and televised and they that's how I first saw his Orfeo was the televised one um, with a with a baritone Orfeo and, and, and heavily edited vocal parts but boy I loved it. Oh, I still love it. I mean, it was it was just such a revelation to have this music come to life so vividly and so expressively, so emotionally, effectively. It's just, oh, it's wonderful. A classic. That's what this is. It's a classic, my friends. Truly a classic. Someday we'll have to talk about Orfeo recordings or something like that, or just go through the opera and have a good time with it. It is such a masterwork. And it's really the first complete, opera that we have that's really an opera. I know everyone talk about talks about, you know, Jacopo Perry's Oiradice as like the first opera officially. But for all intents and purposes, this was it. And we have it. And I think that's fascinating. When you think of all this stuff throughout history that was lost, 
The reason we have it, of course, is that it was written for a royal occasion. And so Orfeo made a presentation copy of the score. And that's why it survived. But, but still, to be able to say, this is the beginning. I mean, that's really something. It really is. And so you, you cannot enjoy opera or Western music <laughs> unless you know Orfeo. It's the beginning and uh, of, of, of a huge and wonderful school. I think that's just, I don't know. It, it, gets me, it gets me all, I just dropped these things, of course. I always do that. It, gets, it just gets me all like, um, I don't know, weepy. It really does. Now I have to see if I can get these, put these back in order. All right, I'm all back organized again. Oh, I'm such a klutz when it comes to this stuff. Anyway, so number two is this one, which is fantastic. Bieber. Bieber was somebody who no one talked about until, really, until Harnoncourt started doing this stuff. And we realized that there was just a world of color and imagination and especially programmatic energy put into simple works for strange assortments of instruments like some, you know, proto trumpet things and some strings and a flute or a something. And this, of course, has Bieber's Battaglia, which is the, the wonderful programmatic thing about the battle with the wounded and the drunken sailors all singing in different keys and, and then some sonatas and other pieces. It's wonderful music. It really is. I mean, I do want to do like more. I want to do so much more of all of this stuff. But Bieber is really a guy. He's a serious composer full of, of fantasy. And this recording was the one that turned most of us on to him. So again, another absolutely essential disc and a wonderful discovery. I mean, it was so exciting when the period instrument movement was discovering music that we hadn't heard before as opposed to mucking up the music we already knew well and pretending that we were hearing it wrong for all of our lives. That was just such a bad thing. And I have to give you hardcore credit. He didn't do much of that. He was, he was his own guy. He was his own crazy. He was a romantic, eccentric, you know, conductor from day one. It didn't matter what repertoire he did. So after that, we had, oh, this was whacked out. The Four Seasons with his wife, Alice Alice Harnoncourt doing the solo violin in really, really, really crazy programmatic excess. This whole performance is nuts. The slow movement of winter, I never got over. It's supposed to be the ice skating. And it's usually, you know, ya da da da, ya da da da. With your little pizzicato accompaniment. Plunk, 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 plunk. It's lovely. Not for Harnacord. Harnacord, it's ya da 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 And the accompaniment's going. Totally, totally out there. I love it. I love it. It's but it's perverse. I mean, it's where we sort of got a sense of Harnacourt being more himself than an authenticist. Because there isn't any way you could say about these performances that they lack individuality or personality or they have some sort of didactic or pedantic thing going. It's all just just let's look at what the poem says and let's go for it, which is of course the way the piece should be played. It really should. I mean, you know, there's no excuse for being dry. And this is what is dry, it's not. It's quite moist. Next, oh yes, Bach. Of course, they had to do a few cantatas. And here we have numbers 80 through 83, which are some famous ones. You get, you get, you're ready. Ein Festeborg ist unser Gott. That's a mighty fortress is our God. You know that one. And then there's Jesus, Jesus, uh, what is this? Schleft. Was soll ich, ich uh, hoffen? Oh, okay. You know, Jesus sleeps, how can I hope? Or something like that. What am I hoping about? Or how, I, whatever. And then we have Ich habe genug. I love Ich habe genug, which means I've had it. Enough is enough already. You know, that's it. And then finally, Er freute Zeit im neuen, neuen something, Bunda. There we go. Yeah. And, you know, Harnoncourt's Bach cantatas were a lot like everything else he did. They were extremely interventionist. And they had boy sopranos who sometimes were off tune. And But it was exciting. 
I mean, this Tell Deck series was so exciting. Do you remember when they came out on LPs? I mean, they were in these beautiful brown sleeves with the score. You got the score with each volume. Yes, it was the old Bach edition score with funny clefs, but it was the score. And you could really follow along with what he was doing. And he split them up. It, he did some and Leonhardt did some. And it was a wonderful, a wonderful contrast because Leonhardt, of course, was his usual sort of grim, straight-laced, absolutely austere, no nonsense, completely without you know, sort of humor or eccentricity. And then there was Harnacourt, who was out there, you know, grooving along Baroquely. And it was a wonderful, wonderful thing, a wonderful moment in the history of the gramophone, as we called it. Um, oh, yeah. And we have Handel's Water Music. This was the English equivalent of that Four Seasons. It's so robust and so kooky. Some of the sounds, you know, instead of horn trills, he does, he does tremolos raspberries you know the, the part that goes you know that one he doesn't do that he goes like that there is no way in hell that that was authentic i don't believe it for a minute not for a minute, but oh my, it's so much fun. And you get the organ concerto, the cuckoo and the nightingale, and the organ concerto in D minor with Herbert Dacchese, and what's not the love? Huh? Nothing. So far, as you can see, this box is doing really well. They've chosen truly iconic Harnacourt recordings, the ones that mattered, the ones that show him off at his best, the ones that bring a, a breath of fresh air to works that we thought we knew, and that introduces us to works that we didn't. That is wonderful programming, and it's the sign of a major, major artist who could do all of this stuff, because he was remarkable. Next, Haydn's symphonies. Happily, they have not chosen London symphonies. And the Paris symphonies are on RCA, and those are amazing. But the London symphonies had their good spots and their perverse moments. Here, fortunately, we have Consensus Musicus Wien, and they're doing the Alleluia Symphony, number 30 in C major, and the Imperiale, which is number 53, and the General Laudon Symphony, which is number 69. And these are fun. These are just fun, bouncy, rambunctious, robust performances. One thing you can say about Harnacourt's Haydn is that is that it was never it was never too reticent and it was never smoothed over. He lets all the bumpiness come out, which is good in Haydn. It really is, because Haydn is a rugged guy. And so you want to hear a little bit of rawness and a bit of edge. And this is this is just excellent. Then we've got some Mozart concert arias with the Chamber Orchestra of Europe and Edita Gruberova. And, you know, she's a coloratura soprano, so you get, let's see, what do you get here? Oh, let's see. Let's see if we can find the famous ones. Uh, it's got to end with, no, they're all, look at these, where are they from? They're from, uh, well, they're concert arias, and they sound very concert-like. So what the heck? It's beautiful music. And if you like Gruberova, then you will like this, because Harnacourt is accompanying, let's face it. And if you don't like Gruberova, you probably won't like this. I think she sounds fine. The singing's quite good. And, you know, this is, I would rather have this Mozart, frankly, than a lot of Harnacourt's other Mozart, which, again, tends to veer off into the, a little too much into the weirdness angle. It might have been nice to do something from his complete Mozart choral music box because there are some wonderful performances of the early masses and things like that. They're just full of full of bounce and joie de vivre. So that could have been a good time, but this is nice. It's nice to have. Next we have uh, Beethoven, Symphonies 2 and 5. These are two of the better performances from Harnacourt's Beethoven cycle. They're exciting, they're fresh, they're lively, and they're not demented like the sixth was. Ugh. It was a greasy, gloppy performance of full of excessive legato, and oh, it was awful. Just awful. So these are good exemplars of his Beethoven cycle, of the better bit of his Beethoven cycle anyway. So that's fine. And then we're moving up in the world. This is chronological, if you noticed. 
more or less, basically chronological. Yes, it is chronological. Um, we have Schubert's Tragic Symphony, Schumann's Fourth, and The Fair Melusina by Mendelssohn. I am not overly fond of these performances. They're not bad. They're really not bad. As always with Harnacourt, sometimes he just gets a little bit too heavily inflected for his own good. And, you know, when the music wants to flow, he feels the need to do something with it, which is, is you know, but it, it's typical. It's typical of his work. They're not grotesque. And, uh, you know, he, he was more controversial when he got out of the Baroque period. And uh, I, I, I'm, you know, it's okay. It's all right. I'm not going to hold it against him. This is a nice disc. Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream with Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. I love Die Erste Walpurgisnacht. This is a very good performance of it. There really aren't any bad ones. I mean, Ormandy did it, Dachnani did it twice. You know, it, it's a splendid work. If you don't know Die Erste Walpurgisnacht, then you really need to. It's a poem by Goethe about the, you know, the, the Walpurgisnacht is, 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 it's it's a pagan ritual on Mount Valpurgis or whatever wherever it is, and in this particular poem, the pagans kill all the Christians, which is really unusual, particularly for Mendelssohn, who had no sense of irony whatsoever. But it's one of his great choral works. It's a magnificent masterpiece with a huge eight or nine minute overture, which is based on some of the same motives as the the Scottish symphony. It's really cool. It really fits into Mendelssohn's life's work. You know, his his love of of the, you know this whole Scottish melos and folk music and all of that stuff. It's all in here. So if you don't know the Erste Walpurgisnacht, you don't know your Mendelssohn. You must listen to it. And it's only about half an hour long. It's not like it's not like it's an ordeal. And the choral singing is great. It's just lots of fun. It really is. Okay, what's that? Oh, look. Oh, baby. Which one? Do I have these things out of order? I'm just curious. Wait a minute. 13 and 12. Yes, here's 12. Okay, let's do this one. Schumann, the violin concerto, the piano concerto with Kramer and Argerich. Well, Argerich recorded the Schumann concerto about 65 times. This is number 44, I think, or something like that. It's a very, very good performance. And the accompaniment is... Oh, it's a little bit on the odd side at times, but, you know, the, the performance has, is full of personality. It has lots of life. Now, this, this violin concerto is really a little bit, a little bit in, on, the, on the wacky side here because uh, they take the nicht zu schnell, the not too fast directive at the end of the violin concerto, the last movement rather literally. But again, it's, it's a very thoughtful and considered and intriguing performance. If you like the Schumann Violin Concerto, you're going to find this really worth listening to. If you don't like it, then nothing is going to convince you, I don't think. It's not that kind of performance. It's a performance for connoisseurs who know their Schumann and want to see what can be done with a work that most people consider to be um, a hopeless failure. It's not. It's a lovely work. It really is. It's just not virtuosic and not particularly fun to play or listen to. But it's, it's nice music. But the piano concerto, of course, is a masterpiece. This is probably Argerich's best version of it. Although, you know, who can tell with her? I mean, you know, she may do 20 more in the next year or so. Now, what else have we got? Oh, wow, yeah. Look at this, Bruckner 7 with no horses protesting. It's a good Bruckner 7th. This is a very quick Bruckner 7th. It's very, very interesting. He does all kinds of non-spiritual things with it. He does a big accelerando at the, at the end of the first movement in the coda. I mean, Bruckner marks it to be, you know, to accelerate somewhat, but not as much as he does. He leaves out the cymbal crash in the slow movement, but he makes a Luftpause before the big climax where the cymbal crash would come in. You know, as, as my colleague Victor Carr reviewed this for ClassicsToday.com, and you can go read his review, which is quite, quite appropriate and descriptively apt, I must say. And, he, you know, I mean, he, he teases you. He thinks, oh, here comes the cymbal, and then it doesn't happen. If you're used to that, I, I think maybe he was uh, trying to, you know, get in a dig at the people who assumed it was going to be there. And the last two movements are just really exciting. 
Very, very exciting scherzo and finale. The Vienna Philharmonic plays gorgeously. He doesn't tamp down the brass ridiculously. He just keeps the thing flowing. It's unusually lively, especially that first movement, which some people take it just a crawl. I mean, it sounds beautiful at a crawl. You know, the slower you take it, the more beautiful it sounds in some respects. But he, re he treats it like a real first movement in Sonata Allegro form. So it has an unusual amount of contrast and energy. Um, and I, I think it's a very, very interesting performance. It's not one that the spiritual Brucknerians are going to get into, but the other people, I think, probably shall. And then last but not least, oh, this is hot stuff. Dvorak, the New World Symphony and the Water Goblin. I mean, the performances of the tone poems are absolutely first class, and this is one of the great, great New Worlds. I mean, if I had to make a short list of like two or three of them, this would be in it, along with Bernstein's, you know, first one for Columbia. This is as great a new world as we've ever heard. And again, Harnoncourt, Harnoncourt could be odd in Dvorak. I mean, the seventh is a little weird. The eighth is fabulous. This is fabulous. And so are all the tone poems. And you really get a sense that he loves the music. He truly understands that Slavic, Central European mellows, and he's just having the time of his life projecting it. And he's not trying to make a point of it being early music. He's not cutting back on vibrato. He's not because he didn't believe that was true. He didn't believe any of these these wacko no vibrato people. He thought that all this music was played with tons of it, and so it has a genuine romantic feeling of ardor and expressivity and freshness. But it's also rhythmically really incisive, and the woodwinds of the Concertgebouw are beyond gorgeous. It's just, oh, it's great. Just great. So that, my friends, is this 15 CD set. And really, I mean, when you think about it, aside from maybe that sort of average-ish Schumann 4, Schubert tragic, which is not even bad, it's just not terribly interesting, there isn't a dud in it. There isn't a bad thing in it. Oh, and I didn't finish. I'm sorry. Here's another one. Strauss waltzes. There you go. Harnoncourt was wonderful with Strauss waltzes. He really was. He did, you know, some New Year's concerts and things. They were terrific. Absolutely terrific. So you get, you know, the usual ones, the Gypsy Baron and, and you know, oh, what else? You get the Tales for the Vienna Woods and the Egyptian March and, and Pizzicato Polka and Under Thunder and Lightning and On the Beautiful Blue Danube and the Fledermouse Overture and some other things. All the standard stuff. Played to a fairly well with uh, Nicholas Harnacourt and who's doing it? Oh, the Concertgebouw. Yeah, what's not to love? Mm. Beautiful. So like I said, there isn't a dud in it. And even though I've left one out, that wasn't a dud either. So it, you're, you're all set. If you want to get a wonderful, wonderful conspectus or circumspectus or prospectus or whatever they call those things of the art of Harnacourt, this really does it. It takes you from the 1600s to 1900, basically, to the late 1890s, and, and does so with, with complete success. And we, we have to confess, how many conductors were there out there at any time in human history who could have done so much music so well? Harnacourt was a genius. He was a major, major, major guy. And this is a, an apt tribute to him. And I'm really delighted that Warner put together something that's this good. So grab it while you can if you don't have the stuff that's in here already. And it's cheap enough so that even if you have half of it, you can afford to get it for the rest. I mean, it's really a good deal, too. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. Take care.